Good afternoon and welcome to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Angelica Spanos. We are following two big trials this Thursday afternoon. All right, so new clips from the prosecution's closing arguments. We haven't heard any of that yet. And uh, the prosecutor there talking about the vans, talking about Gargiulo's cars and how he had basically hid them or parked them in a different location. And that shows that, hey, he knows maybe he was doing something wrong and he had to get them out of that area. Uh, with me today to talk about all of this and break all of this down is our trial attorney, Terry Austin. Terry, thanks for being here. Thanks. Um, let's talk about this a lot because one of the things that the prosecution has done during all of the closing arguments and what we've heard so far is say, hey, we are showing that Gargiulo knew the neighborhood, he knew the area, he knew the in and outs of these women's schedules, their timelines, um, the surrounding neighborhood. And the prosecution, in my opinion, does a great job of showing his knowledge and not only showing how he could kill someone, but potentially kill them quickly and then, you know, eventually cover it up. I agree, Angelica. The prosecution is doing an excellent job. He has the timeline. He's saying that this circumstantial evidence, the vans, is tying to Gargiulo. The fact that he's hidden them far away from his apartment. He's talking about in jail that he has hid these vans. And the other thing about this prosecution is He's not reading from a piece of paper. He is emphatic about what is going on. He's doing a great job. All right, and he goes on to talk a little bit about the DNA evidence, which we know the defense is trying to refute. So let's listen to this clip. So more very, very compelling closing arguments from the prosecution. Um, Terry, one of the interesting things about this is he straight up highlights and says, look, there is no DNA evidence in the Ashler Eller, Ashley Ellerin murder, which is interesting that he just says that because it obviously is reminding the jurors, oh, wait, there's no DNA. But he then takes it a step further and connects everything. Talk about that. That's what makes him such a great prosecutor. He knows that there's no DNA for Ashley Ellerin, but he's tying the defendant to the scene with the footprints. So the jury's thinking, well, there's DNA for these other victims, but not for this particular victim. But the prosecution is not going to let that slide. He's making sure that that jury knows Gargiulo was in this house and he killed her, and those were his footprints. And that's him bringing up the boot? Yes, exactly. Found a blue circle. And one of the other things um, we were t talking about while we were listening to that clip is just his delivery. It's very calm and collected, but it's still very effective what you want from a prosecutor. He's one of the best prosecutions I've ever heard give a closing because, to your point, he's organized, he's clear, he's calm, and yet he's able to be emphatic. Perfect. And talking about this, this whole trial a little bit, we're going to play some of the defense's closing arguments coming up here, but sticking with the prosecution for now, what do you think of their closing and how they handled this? This is obviously a, a serial killer here, multiple murders. How'd they do? I think they did a great job. I don't think he could have done any better. He's making sure that the jury understands there's evidence against this defendant for each and every one of these attacks. And the first thing he said during this closing was, it started with Michelle. She's the hero here, and it'll end with Michelle. That's how it was tied back to all of the other victims. Okay, so basically of the defense telling the jurors that he didn't need to prove that someone else killed Ashley Ellerin, but just had to establish that another possible suspect could cast that reasonable doubt um, on Gargiulo's guilt. Um, so, Terry, when you listen to that, and obviously we still have plenty more to go through with these closings, but what, what do you make of that? I'm not impressed because he's not specific enough. He's talking generally about the law. He's saying the prosecution has to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. If I'm on that jury, I'm thinking to myself, yes, but there was blood there and there's DNA there and all of that is being tied back to the defendant. And we have this pattern that's been established, uh, multiple victims here. Not, not that convincing. That's exactly right. So, you know, there are four women here, but only three women are being victimized here and being involved in this particular trial because the first woman was in Illinois. But you're right, they're showing that pattern and that practice. The fact that he stalked these women, the fact that he used a knife in all of the killings. And I think that that's going to be more than enough to indicate to the jury beyond a reasonable doubt that he did it. 
All right, Terry, thanks. Let's go on to listen to the rest of the closing arguments from the defense. Okay, so more from the defense, really just trying to point these killings to a different suspect. Um, one of the interesting things about this case that we've been talking about, again, since it started in May, is that it gained a lot of national attention because of one of the witnesses, and as we know, that witness is Ashton Kutcher. He ended up testifying in May because one of the victims, him and Ashley Ellerin, had plans for a first date, um, and that was the exact night that she was murdered. He ended up going to her house. She never came to the door, and uh, he saw blood in the house through one of the windows, but thought it was red wine. Very wild situation there. But let's talk a little bit about the media attention surrounding this trial because obviously Ashton Kutcher involved, but also maybe because this is a serial killer in Hollywood, you know, one of the most desirable areas to live, and you have this tragedy hitting this area. Talk about that, Terry. It's definitely one of the most high profile cases that I've seen and I think it's for the very reasons that you've described. You have a serial killer and he's going around California and he's stabbing these women and slitting their throats. That in and of itself is enough to grab media attention. Then when you add the fact that Ashton Kushner is there, you know, he's Hollywood, he's very attractive and he dated one of the women, that's really going to make the profile even higher. And when you have media attention surrounding a trial like this as a juror um, how do they filter out that outside voice and impact and all of that well the judge instructs the jury that they are not supposed to be looking at any coverage of the case while they are sitting as jurors so hopefully the jury will take that to heart and not let any of that influence them even though it's probably on the television all the time and uh, you, we've got to say bye to you here soon, but what are your final thoughts on the Hollywood Ripper trial? You know, this is something, again, we've been talking about for months, hopefully coming to an end shortly here. Final thoughts? I think that the jury is looking at the defendant himself. He's laughing throughout the trial. There's no remorse, and there's so much DNA evidence. I believe he will be convicted. And uh, what about with these defense closing arguments? Do you think they're doing a good job of kind of putting it all together, wrapping it up here in their last chance? I think the defense is just the opposite of the prosecution. He's not very lively. He hasn't gotten much to say about these specific crimes. He's just generally saying beyond a reasonable doubt, not enough. All right, Terry Austin, trial attorney, thank you so much for joining us today on Law and Crime. We have plenty more after the break, including more about the Hollywood Ripper trial and the live trial we're following today, Eric Boyd in Tennessee. Stay with us.